it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved, uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Cliff to the show. Cliff, thanks for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. I, I love doing other people's podcasts all the time and just kind of talking about Squatch, man. It seems like that's what I get to do nowadays. So, Yeah, it was not, It was so funny having Bobo on. I was telling you uh, before we started recording, I didn't really go into it. You know, Bobo is always portrayed, and I, and I love Bobo. Don't get me wrong. I actually really, really like the guy. And But what really surprised me is he's portrayed as, you know, like on Finding Bigfoot. They're like, hey, Bobo, get up there, you big gorilla. Let's see how you compare it to the Bigfoot. But when he talked to Bobo, it, it, when we did the whole quarantine trivia game, uh, I'll tell you a little secret about that. I actually asked a bunch of very difficult questions prior to us starting recording. And I'm like, there's no way either one of these guys is going to know this stuff. It wasn't the questions you heard on the on the game. Those were easy questions. And Bobo was just sitting there rambling off answers like there's no tomorrow. And it's funny, too, because when we got done, I was telling Tony, I was like, man, is this guy like a genius or what? Like, I've never... He, I had to tell him to slow down during the game on his answers because the audience is playing along. But he knew all these answers, and I was so shocked by how much information this guy has in his head. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Bobo um, is probably one of the uh, most underestimated Bigfooters, I think, out there. Um, and by the way, I don't know if it's a coincidence or, or whatever else or, you know, read into it what you want. But literally, Bobo just called me. Oh, dude. Yeah, as as you were talking, his my phone lit up and it was Bobo. So <laughs> whatever that's worth. Um, yeah, he, he's tapped into all sorts of different realms. But anyway, yeah, Bobo is one of the most underestimated Bigfooters out there. Uh, by far, he is uh, one of the best read Bigfooters, not only in the Bigfoot literature, but other weird stuff and actually just current events and science in general. Um, it, it, whenever we're flying anywhere, you know, for a gig uh, or on finding Bigfoot for that matter, um, when I saw Bobo getting on the plane, he inevitably had some some sort of like science magazine under his arm that he was going to devour on the plane ride. Um, he reads all the time. And, you know, just because, uh, you know, finding Bigfoot edited him that way or, or you know, South Park edited him that way uh, doesn't make him so. He's extremely intelligent, has a tremendous amount of experience in a wide variety of fields. Yeah, like I said, I was impressed. I was impressed. And he just, he, I mean, his ability to ramble off information and, like he said, even science information. I mean, he's it, it just blew me away, and he's and he's so likable too. That's the other thing, you know, just like yourself, Cliff. And you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about before we get into Bigfoot, I guess it's kind of about Bigfoot, um, is your North American Bigfoot Center. And for the audience listening, it's this museum out there in Boring, Oregon. Um, if you get a chance when this whole coronavirus thing goes away. 
go check it out, the North American Bigfoot Center. And Cliff, you did a thing on Facebook where you kind of did a real quick, brief walk around, and I was really impressed with it. I mean, some of the stuff you have in there. Can you talk a little bit about this this museum and how it got started and what people can expect when they come down to check it out? Well, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and, and you know that that Facebook Live is still up there. You, anybody can go check it out on our Facebook page um, if you want to look at it. Uh, it's basically my wife and I taking a, a mini tour of the museum for the people who tuned in because uh, we're closed right now, unfortunately, uh, because of the whole plague thing. We had to shut our doors, and we wanted to. And so we've been kind of shaking our tin cup to people because you know if your doors are shut, you can't make m- money for rent. So we've been shaking our tin cup and selling things online for a while. You know, the last couple of weeks, and uh, you know we're not. We're not pulling a salary, but we're cutting our losses, which is really nice. So we wanted to do a Facebook Live to thank our audience um, who can't come to the museum and support us in that way, but they've been supporting us else how. So we did a Facebook Live or whatever, and uh, and what you're looking at on Facebook Live is really the museum 1.0 or maybe 1.1 because we – we became fully open this past October. So October 2019 is when we had everything finally up and running. Um, and the genesis of that was basically, you know, Finding Bigfoot went off the air in May of 2018. And I spent the next year, you know, uh, scrapping a living by traveling all throughout the country doing speaking engagements, which is a lot of fun. But at the end of the day, it's not it's not a really great way to make a living because you, you're out of town from, you know, Thursday to Sunday or Monday and you, you don't you don't make that good of money for the weekend. Basically, it's enough to barely scrape by. But you know, uh, so I was thinking, well, what else could I do? Because I could go back to teaching. I was a credentialed teacher, professional educator for 14 years. But at the same time, maybe you know, this this Bigfoot thing has been such a blessing in my life. Maybe there's a way I can continue doing that and scraping a living. Cause it's not like you, you'd make a ton of money teaching either. Well, I can not make a ton of money doing Bigfoot stuff too. Let's try that for a while. And so. Um, my wife and I, uh, with the help of some friends uh, like Minty Minton, for example, who's a great graphic artist and um, a retail specialist, we started putting together a plan for uh, a museum because uh, I looked out at Dave Becerra, um, out at Dave and Melinda Becerra out in uh, Blue Ridge, Georgia. They have a successful Bigfoot museum uh, called Expedition Bigfoot. Um, I looked at Lauren Coleman. Um, he has his International Cryptozoology Museum. Uh, Mike Rugg down in Felton, California, another small – cool little museum. And I think, well, gosh, that might be a cool thing to do. I mean, after all, I do have a lot of Bigfoot stuff lying around the house. Uh, I, have a, I have a very large uh, track and impression collection um, from a number of uh, unknown hominoid species throughout the world. I've got some uh, neat, interesting artifacts from history, et cetera. So, so we started piecing this thing together and finally got the doors open. And it's really kind of my effort to continue my my career as an educator, I think. Uh, cause when I was on finding Bigfoot, I, I, I just saw that as a different sort of classroom, you know, kind of the classroom we see now during the plague when all the teachers have to do it online. Um, just uh, my classroom went from 30, 10 year olds a week to, you know, 1.2 million a week. And, uh, my job was to convey enthusiasm and, and spread knowledge about Sasquatches while I was on finding Bigfoot. And so this is just my you know, my version of that in the post finding Bigfoot days where people can come and, and, you know, if they have a story, they can share it. And if they, uh, if they have some evidence and they want to analyze, they can share it with me and I can tell them what I think about it. And most importantly, what I find is that the more skeptical a person is, the more unaware of the evidence they are. And so this is my way to, to kind of put the evidence in their face and say, well, yeah, but if Bigfoots aren't real, why are all these things internally consistent as a data set? And why does the history go back to pre-written history times, pre you know, prehistoric times essentially, you know, the Native American community and the indigenous community in North America? Um, it, it just kind of expose them to the evidence. It's like what Rene De, it's like what Rene De Hinden said. You know, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact language. Knowing Rene De Hinden, there's probably some sort of f bomb in there anyway. <laughs> but basically, he he said, you know, without the facts, your opinion is is worthless. So uh, here's the chance to give me some to give some facts out to the community like hey here's the evidence look at these footprints look how internally consistent they are look how they align well with other um, extinct hominin footprints and then come back and talk to me about how these footprints aren't real you know so that's kind of my way of educating a public who's who's desperately in need of education about sasquatches Yeah I can't wait till it opens I can't wait to come check it out you know we should do a podcast from there man that would be oh, kind of cool. great yeah. yeah, absolutely. Maybe a visual one or something, some video thing, but if you, you can use that for your members area or something. Yeah, we'll just do a live podcast and invite everyone to come down to the museum and check it out. It'll be a lot of fun. 
Oh, that'd be great. It'd probably be a good way to drum some interest up after we're allowed to open again, too. So we're going to have some making up of uh, finances <laughs> to do at that point. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I hear you. I can't wait. I can't wait to uh, check it out. And I, I was going to ask you about skeptics and everything. Um, you know, before we get into that, and I know, I think most people have heard your, you know, how you got into, I always hate asking people how they get into Bigfoot because it's such a basic rhetorical question, you know what I mean? And yeah. I, and I think in your situation, you know, you were growing up, you were a musician, uh, you got into teaching. One thing I liked about how you actually got into it is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm jumping ahead so we can get to encounters, but, you know, you started seeing evidence of this. You started really looking into it and educating yourself. And did you actually believe that it could be real? Or were you just looking at the evidence to kind of see, is this BS or before finding Bigfoot? I grew up in the 70s, right? Uh, during, you know, uh, in search of and, you know, all that sort of stuff, you know, all, all the schlocky documentaries that were on TV at the time. And um, I've always been a weird person just kind of, kind of a weirdo in general. And so I've, I've always been drawn to weird interests and weird topics and stuff and, and, and monsters too. God, I just loved monsters growing up. Godzilla, you know, the Frankenstein, all that stuff. And so the Bigfoot thing was just another monster for a long time. And I sure wanted them to be real. Uh, that that's, it's, it's kind of where I was at for most of my youth. Um, until I was in college when I actually started reading about the evidence that had been collected on Sasquatches. And I, and luckily for me, you know, the first book I really ran across was the Halpin and Ames book, um, Man Like Monsters on Trial, which was, uh, I guess a synopsis or, uh, maybe that's not the right word. Um, it was basically all the papers that were presented at that 1978 British Columbian conference. Um, you know, so Barbara Wasson stuff is in there. John Green stuff is in there. Uh, you know, Krantz had something in there, if I remember right. And a lot of anthropologists in general talking about the evidence. And when I started reading through that, it was very – conservative and sober and when and and it was just it was just very uh in tone that is you know scientific basically in tone and it's like oh my god this stuff like yeah how is it that every native tribe has a word for these things in north america how could that possibly be true unless these things were a biological thing you know and the, the more i read about it the more i said oh my god these things just might be real and god then i got a hold of Krantz's book because uh, Krantz published his book, I think, in 91 or 92. And the, the time period I'm talking about right now is right around 93 and 94. Um, really, I think 90, 93 in that area. Um, because 94 is when I first started doing field work specifically for Sasquatches. So it was the previous school year. I started devouring everything I could. And when I started reading about Krantz's work, it, it just became, okay, like on one hand, it's either a real animal. On the other hand, it's either – you know, a hoax of some sort or misinterpretation or, you know, some, you know, soup made of those ingredients. Um, and, and it just became so ridiculous to even consider that this might all be a hoax with absolutely nothing behind it. it the Just logically, it just makes zero sense. So it was the evidence that turned me. But until that point, it was just something that I thought was funny and cool and I wanted to be real. But again, it was the evidence. Even before I started actually going out and doing field work, it was the evidence. It was reading books, um, which unfortunately is very few people seem to do nowadays. They all seem to get their um, the big of information off of YouTube from questionable sources and things. And it's like, no, go to, go straight to the source of the scientists who worked on this stuff and read what they wrote. And I think that's probably the most important thing any Bigfooter could do. But anyway, that, that's kind of the genesis of what I was doing at the time. It's like uh, I've always been left-brained in a lot of ways um, to try to balance out my right brain, you know, and uh, looking at the evidence, uh, um, which is the most important thing. Trying to, to me, at least trying to balance out the uh, musician, the rock and roll, the rock and roll cliff. Yeah, yeah, something like that, <laughs> something like that. You know, because we all have gut feelings, etc., which is fine. But um, some decisions should not be made on your gut feelings; they should be made um, on data. And I think the existence of Sasquatch is probably one of those things. Because without the data, you're basically doing what I did for most of my youth, which is like hoping they're real. Yeah, you know, um, there, there's also subjective experiences, et cetera, that convince you. Um, but the data, I think, is even more powerful than the subjective experiences. Tell me about the first time you encountered one of these things. Kind of what were you doing, and, huh. and what happened? Yeah, the first time I knew that I was around one. Um, and I may have been around one once or twice before that. Like I remember, uh, I, I started going to Bluff Creek in 1994. 
uh, with this naive idea of finding the Patterson Gimlin fil- film site. You know, and I didn't know where the heck it was. And I later found it. I, I, I've later found it. I think in '97, I believe, was the first time that I actually knew I was there. Um, but in '94, I just kind of looked at the map and was like, oh well, look, look, there's a place where something called Bigfoot Creek flows into Bluff Creek. You know, and it's, maybe that's why they named it there. You know, just kind of naive and going for it. And I started going out to the field, et cetera. And um, during that time, I was a teacher. So I had the in summers off, et cetera, so I could go out and poke around and have fun and stuff. And so I'd go to Bluff Creek for like two weeks. And one time, um, uh, my, my, my first wife, I'm on my second wife now, and this one will stick. But my first wife, who's a lovely person, we just didn't belong together and, you know, took a little while to figure it out. And we're still good friends to this day, actually. Her name's Monica. Um, so Monica and I were camping at Bluff Creek. And uh, we were at Laos Camp. We were going for a little walk. It was in the late afternoon, not dusk, but, you know, towards dusk. And we were up at Notice Creek Landing. If you're familiar with the area, it's just, you know, probably five, 600 yards, probably from Laos Camp, maybe a thousand yards. And um, you have to cross the bridge. The bridge is really cool, too. I mean, I don't want to nerd out on you too hard, but the bridge has the date 1958 like built into it because like, okay, oh my God, Jerry Crew built this one. Jerry Crew built this probably a month before he got those footprints because now I know where the footprint casts were oh, taken cool. um, in, the night, in October of 58 that gave us the word Bigfoot and I was a little bit further down the road. So he built that probably in Ju- July or August or something of 58. So it's pretty cool. And then right on the other side of that bridge, the bridge goes over Notice Creek, by the way, is uh, Notice Creek Landing um, and a tremendous number of encounters happened there. Um, so many uh, that I think that Sasquatch has actually used Notice Creek um, to go up and down to the top of uh, Onion Mountain and stuff. But anyway, that's a side note. So um, Monica and I were there at Notice Creek Landing and we're kind of walking around this little island thing in the middle there. And we we're over by the creek. Not not We couldn't see the creek. It was too thick um, down in the area. But I, I heard – I could have sworn that I heard something walking like downstream from up above in, uh, Notice Creek. And it was like – well, I could hear footsteps in the duff, basically, moving very slowly, like step, 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 like that slowly. And and, and I, I told Monica, like, hey, hey like, stop listening. And she heard it. And we're listening. And like we start whispering to each other, like, what is it? I don't know. And like, whatever it is, it's coming down. And it, it was coming down. Like, I like, didn't realize we were there because we we're standing still. For, for several minutes, you know, and um, and then it got below us basically and, and it had to be 50, 60, 70 yards away or something on the other slope. Um, see, because uh, we we're on this landing and then the, the hill went down to Notice Creek and then the hill goes up on the other side, you know, and uh, so we, and there are these smaller trees, much, much larger now, but smaller trees, like maybe 10, 12 feet tall or something like that. The replant basically from logging between us and the creek. So we couldn't see down there. And but I could see the trees on the opposite slope above these shorter trees that were closer to me. And then whatever it was, was basically right below us. And, and like, uh, and Monica and I are looking back and forth, like, what, it's right there. It's right there. The one, then all of a sudden, one of these trees on the other side of the slope, uh, it just shook like a, like a twig, like this 80 foot tall tree. Um, at, at the same time, I, there's this huge crack that just echoed up and down Notice Creek, like Canyon there. Um, and this whole tree just shook like a, a twig. And like she and I just look at each other like, holy bleep, right? Um, and that scared the hell out of both of us, even though we were there looking for it. Like we, it scared the hell out of both of us. And then, uh, and so I go, well, 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 Monica, let's, let's go to the bridge. Maybe we can see it you know, like looking down from the bridge or whatever. So we go back to the bridge and we don't see anything. It's too overgrown. We rush back to the spot where we first initially heard the thing. And then we can hear the same footsteps going back up Creek, you know, (laughs) much faster than it was coming down. And then, so she and I make our way down to the Creek and try to, and and like, I remember standing in the Creek and a dusk is falling and we're, um, we're, you know, we only had to go like 20 yards, but it took three or four minutes. It's pretty thick right there. Um, or maybe two or three minutes more accurately. And we're standing in the Creek. I mean, the water's lapping around her and I'm thinking, I, I t- looked at Monica and said, Hey, whatever it is, it's right there. We should go. And she looks at me and I can, and, and we're both scared, mind you, but she looks at me and she goes, if you're going, you're going alone. And I went, Oh crap. Yeah. Cause at that end, that's like, Oh God damn. 
you know, and I, I had a camera and everything. And I'm thinking, well, I'm honestly too scared to go alone because because that was a tremendous show of force. Right. Um, and so we we start looking around for the tree and it's in the middle of this rock. We find the tree and, and it's it's a <laughs> it, the whole thing was just staggering and humbling, I should say. Uh, and yeah, that, that was a crazy trip. So that's the first time I absolutely positively knew that I, I was around a Sasquatch, even though there has, there's always that element of doubt, I guess, because I didn't see the thing. But um, but I would judge that to be a Sasquatch. And yeah, that was the but, first time that I was aware of being around one. So What do you make of that behavior of it swinging the tree or shaking the tree? To... Oh, it, just, it just broke something off the tree. Like I'm assuming it was a, like a four to six inch branch or something. But because there's so much jumble and, and, you know, and forest, you know, debris. And it was in the middle of a landslide, et cetera, underneath the tree. But there's no hope of finding what actually broke. But I'm assuming it broke a tree. What I interpret out of that is a very typical, you know, um, primate behavior. I mean, humans show that behavior too, um, getting all pissed off. And I, I, I think that per, I'm guessing this is all speculation of course i'm guessing that it walked into a situation that it didn't realize we were there and when it did realize we were there it it was like probably a little bent out of shape like oh crap you know it and then wanted to show like hey up yours and then broke that branch at us and then when it had the chance and we weren't there it left as soon as it could was there a time where you you saw the creature i mean you knew for sure that that's it that's what uh, I'm no, no, I've had one sighting, and it was through a thermal imager, so it wasn't a great sighting. Um, uh, and I, and but I think it was a Sasquatch. The context sure points to it, in my opinion. And, and it was actually on our first full fledged night investigation for the first season of Finding Bigfoot. Like when Matt goes, "There's something on the hill," you know, he's yeah. talking about the Sasquatch <laughs> that we all saw. Yeah. Um, Matt thinks it was a um, like a, a drunk hillbilly. He said spying on us, whatever that means, at two o'clock in the morning, two miles off trail. And maybe he's right. But but we were at a place with repeated encounters over a long period of time, um, where nobody knew where where we were going to be, and we were about two miles off trail at about two in the morning. So it seems unlikely that um, that was a drunk hillbilly spying on us. Um, although again, maybe Matt's right. Matt's not a dumb guy at all. But. Uh, it sure acted like a Sasquatch. Uh, when Matt yelled at it, um, it started walking away, and then he yelled at it again, and it froze for 10, 20 seconds on one foot. Um, and not a week later, we were filming a Georgia episode, and the, that uh, Sasquatch in Georgia had exhibited the same behavior um, when it was uh, when the gig was up, so to speak, when it knew it had been sighted. It stopped and froze, which is very typical behavior for all animals, really. Um, and then um, Matt took off after it. He was going to drag the um, the person spying on us down the hill oh, by its ears, that. his ears or something. I don't know. Um, and then uh, he took off after it, and uh, he had a thermal imager on one eye and a night vision on the other, and he never saw it again. It totally outdistanced him, even though it was navigating a wooded hillside in the dark without a light. And then forty five minutes, and I never saw it again either. By the way, I tried to. I tried to get in front of where I thought it was going, but I was incorrect. Um, and then about 40 minutes later, we got, we got a vocalization off that hillside, um, a big off that hill, just one yell, like a frustrated yell or something at us. Um, so I'm inclined to think that was probably a Sasquatch. I can't say 100%, um, but it sure seems like it was. Yeah, I do remember that. I remember laughing because – Bobo and I almost, he said it on the show and I said it about the same time. I go, what's he going to do once he catches it? You know, what's he, <laughs> is he going to tackle well, it? You know what I mean? Like what's. I've often thought whether it was a Sasquatch or a drunk hillbilly spying on us, I sure wish you would have caught it. It would have been quite the show. Yeah. Yeah. Drunk hillbilly doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. You know what I mean? Someone's going to call back, hey, I'm up here or, you know what I mean? They're, they're generally not going to freeze like a tree. And you're right. You do hear that behavior a lot uh, from a lot of witnesses. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things I want to ask you, and I thought you had a great argument for it, because there, there's a lot of skeptical questions I get asked, and a lot of them I don't really, there's not a great answer for, in my opinion. Um, and I can give you examples, but, you know, what do you say to someone who says they're not a hardcore skeptic to where they're not even going to look into it, but they look into it and they're like, well, where is the evidence? And you can even go back to your museum that you opened, what kind of evidence would you present to someone uh, as an argument for them being real to a skeptic that's willing to listen? Well, I think the evidence comes in several different forms. Um, and a lot of it is soft evidence, uh, which doesn't carry a lot of weight. Yeah, in the legal system, it probably does, um, but not in science. Um, but 
I, in fact, I do a presentation on the best evidence for Sasquatch, and I always start with the native stuff because uh, you want to know what's in the woods, man. You talk to an indigenous person. They know um, because they've been living here pretty much forever, just like Sasquatches have been. And uh, it, 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 so uh, let me back up by saying science isn't – Science has a bad rap, I think, especially nowadays with this distrust of experts that seems to be going on in the culture. Um, and they think that scientists have these ivory towers where they protect information and they don't want the populace. It's like this here, this whole conspiratorial paranoid world that we live in has really given a bad name to science, which is ridiculous, you know, um, in my opinion, um, in my not so humble opinion. But really, at the end of the day, and I taught this in, to my 10-year-olds when I taught school, um, science is a process. It should be a verb as far as I'm concerned. Science is a process to find out what is real, real for everybody in a shared reality, I should say, um, because subjectivism is something different. It's just true for you, um, but you're not the universe. We should we, we should be looking at what's true for a – you know. For, for for a shared culture or a shared reality. And that's what science does. It is a it is a process to ask a question and see if your answer could be true or not. See, so because you start with facts, and some of the facts here are that uh, Native Amer Native people all throughout North America have have stories about things that match that description in the woods. Um, people continue to see things that match that description to this day. And big old footprints are found in the woods, sometimes in very, very remote places. Hey, these are all facts. There's no disputing that as a fact, okay? Uh, so we start with those facts and we ask a question. What the hell's going on? And you can you, – then from there, you speculate. You – well, this might be going on or that might be going on, and that's a hypothesis, right? And then what you do is you go out and gather evidence. You, you gather information and to see if your information – supports your hypothesis or points to another explanation you know and if it supports your hypothesis great you keep you go find more you, you and this is a weird thing that people have a hard time wrapping their heads around you're always trying to prove yourself wrong you're always looking for that thing that shows that you're on the wrong track and something else is true and if you can't find it well then maybe you're right but you never stop looking to prove yourself wrong now, that's what i love science you know science is one of those yeah, because I'm wrong all the time. And thankfully, science is one of those disciplines that actually celebrates it when you're wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because you're getting closer to the truth. As far as the evidence, what I would point to is like, okay, let's start with Native American, like uh, indigenous people. If Bigfoots are in fact a real animal, which is my hypothesis, they're just a primate like us, a lot like us actually. If these things are real, a normal part of our landscape, there should be stories of them in the Native uh, oral traditions. And sure enough, there are. Um, and a lot of these stories have the same behaviors that we – that the contemporary witnesses report. Um, the sounds they make, banging on stuff, stealing salmon, throwing rocks, the, 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 that's the smells associated with them, the size, the descriptions. If these are real animals, there should be a record of them in the Native literature or Native oral tradition rather, and there is. OK, that, that is actually a form of evidence. If these things have always been here, as I hypothesize, or pretty much always been here, um, then there should be a record of them in historic newspapers as well. As the white settlers uh, got here and started pushing into the interior from both coasts, um, they should have been running across these things. And sure enough, that also exists. There's a really strong tradition of uh, these things being reported in historic newspapers. OK. And if they're real, they should still be seen today. OK. There's another check off our list. Right. And then, then we can start getting into the physical evidence. Right. Because all those things are rather soft evidence, a little squishy. You know what I mean? Because, you know, anthropologists point out that like, yeah, but they have Native Americans have these other things that we their spirit animals and all this other stuff. And Sasquatches or Zonaqua or Bukwas or whatever you want to call them. Omas, they're, they're probably just those. OK, so that's a little squishy, shall we say. It's soft evidence. Well, then we could start looking at the hard evidence, OK? And, and right now, the best uh, hard evidence that's available, in my opinion, are the impressions, the, the casts, in other words. Um, whether it's footprint casts or handprint casts or a precious few other body parts. So when the footprint casts are there, OK, we can take that. Let's do a little scientific thing on there. We have a 300 or so footprint casts on record between Dr. Meldrum and myself. That's about the number we've settled on, 300, 350, somewhere in there. If they're real, 
they should show the same features no matter where or when they were cast. And those features, since Sasquatches are not humans, um, period, they're not Homo sapiens sapiens, they're built differently, they have different mass, they walk differently, they have different body proportions, et cetera. Um, they, they should show differences in the, in the structure of the foot that would support that kind of weight walking in a similar way as humans. And sure enough, that's true. And we all know about the flexibility of the mid part of the foot, you know, mid tarsal break and all that jazz. Um, it, by the way, the mid tarsal break, I want to point that out. That's a real strong piece of evidence right there um, because that was only explained by Dr. Meldrum in 2000 or 2001. That's when that feature of the Sasquatch foot became common knowledge because he published a paper on it. Uh, and, and that paper was based off his own observations of the footprints in five points in 1996, as well as a slew of footprint casts that he had copied at that point from uh, Dr. Grover Krantz, who he was speaking to at the time. And Krantz also noticed the same flexibility, but although he didn't have the same expertise as Dr. Meldrum did. Uh, Krantz was more a uh, bone guy, you know, osteology, yeah. where um, Dr. Meldrum specifically is an anatomist with a specialty in um, foot structure and what led to bipedalism. So it took his uh, observations through his specific filters to see what we'd all been looking at. Um, and if, like, uh, if you take the, the photograph by Lyle Laverty of that one particular Sasquatch footprint for the Patterson-Gimlin film site um, with the huge mid-tarsal pressure ridge in the middle of it. And luckily, Bob Titmus cast that one when he was there nine days later. Um, like We've been looking at that for you know since 67 you know, but, it, but it took Dr. Meldrum to see what we were all looking at for so long because Dr. Meldrum like literally cut his teeth on studying the foot structure uh, of um, Australopithecines, which is a hominin, an extinct hominin, the most famous of which is the Lucy fossil that most people seem to be familiar with. She was an Australopithecus afarensis. And he, if I remember right, he worked on his master's degree um, with a specialist in that. So he literally cut his teeth on the foot structure of non-human um, ancestors uh, of our own. you know. And so when he saw that, and then he saw those prints um, in 1996 at Five Points outside of Walla Walla, Washington, he saw the same sort of thing about the flexibility in the mid part of the foot. Again, Krantz noted this in his book, but he didn't really have the expertise that uh, in this one special thing that Dr. Meldrum did that uh, enabled Jeff to see this. And so if you put that in context, we, the Bigfoot community, got to learn about this when Jeff published the paper in 2000 or 2001. But yet, if you go back, oh, well, heck, that photograph that Lyle Laverty took at the PG site, um, that was in, from 67 and in fact, if you go back to the very first Sasquatch footprint cast that is still in existence, it's um, the Jerry Crew print. And I had an opportunity to examine the original a number of years ago uh, and take a lot of photographs of it and share those with Jeff. And he's now seen it as well. There is that same feature in the original 1958 footprint. Uh, and it is consistent. It is consistently placed. Um, it is right behind where the metatarsals should be. And even though the metatarsals and Sasquatches seem to have been shortened over time, um, so the, the, the ankle bone uh, is further forward on the foot, which is one of those necessary biomechanical redesigns of the foot to carry a mass of that size. Krantz writes about that in his book. Um, yeah, so it, it, that marker, that marker in the footprint itself of the of the pressure ridge is in the same place again and again and again and again and again no matter where that uh, footprint is found and cast or no matter by whom um but yet there's there's right right there there's 42 43 years of seeing the same feature without having an explanation and when the explanation comes around we have a perfectly normal explanation that could be found. Uh, there's precedence of it in other species, Australopithecines, for example, um, and, and other ape species as well, orangutans, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas. Um, they all have the same feature in their foot, which is what it should be, right? And Because we're talking about science here. Let's, I, I, I'm hypothesizing these are just primates of some sort, just like we are. And if that is true, then they should have this structure because they're not long distance persistence hunters like human beings evolved into. Um, and sure enough, that is there. And it is in the same place as it should be um, for a creature of their size, and blah, blah, blah. You just go down the list, man. Like that is really solid scientific evidence that is really difficult to explain away. 
And that's not even talking about the handprints and the butt prints and all these other things that we have too. Yeah. And then, then, then the hair morphology, I, I can go on. There's a, a tremendous amount of evidence that squarely uh, puts Sasquatch in the realm of real animals. Yeah, and I know there's uh, audio too as well, and I know that may fall lower on the evidence scale because – you know, you're not seeing what's making it, but there's some bizarre sounds that come out that don't line up with any other animal. And, um, yeah, it is fascinating. It's, let me ask you, what do you make going away from the skeptic and just talking to Cliff, what do you make of, uh, like the native Americans? There is a lot of stories with the native Americans, but there's a lot of bizarre stories with the native Americans too, as well. Um, they'll talk about them vanishing. They'll talk about them, just doing bizarre things that seem to be very paranormal. Not all Native Americans, but there is a good portion of them that believe he's in some spirit world and enters our world. And do you, what do you do with that information? I know it's hard to prove scientifically, but um, do you just toss that out, or what? What do you what do you make of that? No, and I don't. I don't toss it out. But I also uh, they also do, uh, a lot of Native stories have. Um, uh, perfectly normal animals doing extraordinary slash paranormal slash religious sort of things um, in, in their oral tradition. And you, I, what, what I think one needs to do is examine um, uh, stories, uh, cultural traditions in the context of the culture itself. Um, and I think uh, uh, – you know, native the native cultures have a, a rich oral tradition, and the oral stories remain accurate. And the studies have been done that show that uh, oral stories remain uh, surprisingly accurate for up to 200 years or so. Then after that, they start going a little off. Uh, um, and, and, the, and, you know, it's like the game of telephone where you whisper into somebody's ear and yeah. by the time it comes back, you know, it's a slightly different story. Um, they've, they've done studies on oral traditions and they're surprisingly accurate for a long time. But after a certain point, it, it gets, goes a little off the rails, you know, not necessarily wrong because we're talking about cultural beliefs, which is different than um, objective reality. And another good example of that are like the diehard Christian folks, right? The fundamentalist Christians that still believe the world is only 6,000 years old or something like that, even though the evidence is clearly not – that's not the case, right? Um, but but yeah, that's the world they live in, right? So when they approach the Sasquatch thing, they look towards their one source of information, which is the Bible, and try to make sense out of it in the context of their own culture. So that's where all this Nephilim stuff comes up, you know, these giants and uh, Mormons, for example. And I've had long conversations uh, with Dr. Meldrum, who is a Mormon, by the way, uh, about this too. Mormons take a different perspective on the whole thing because they're approaching the subject in the through the filter of their own culture. They think uh, – or many of them think that uh, Sasquatches are actually Cain who was doomed to roam the earth after murdering his brother Abel and had hair covering and like outcasts and stuff. So um, I approach the native beliefs uh, with respect, of course, um, but in, as the same sort of thing that's happening nowadays. People have their own culture and they see the world through that culture. I think one of the most challenging things one can do is try to remove the filters off of our own eyes and to not observe things based on your own culture, which is next to impossible, by the way, but it's a fun exercise. And I, I like exercises. It's like it's like jogging. I hate jogging. I fail at it, but it's still I still like to do it sometimes. You know what I mean? Uh, just because I'm going to fail doesn't mean I'm not going to try something. Uh, but it, I think it's a, a useful exercise to try to remove cultural contexts because at the end of the day, culture is not our friend. You know, like I, I know that, that that probably rubs people who have real strong traditions in their cultures and stuff the wrong way, but I don't think culture's our friend. Culture tells you what's okay and what's not okay, how it's okay to behave and act and do, with things to do. And who the hell are they to tell me what I can and can't do or what other people are going to approve of? Up theirs, man. Uh, so I, I, I've, I've kind of uh, this – I'm kind of a rebellious against the idea of culture, uh, cultural norms. Um, so I, I think it's maybe I'm the kind of person that likes to um, try to look at things outside of the cultural filters and whatnot, you know? <laughs> no, and, I, and I think you're right. I think you have to do that. I think, you know, um, you know, like my culture preference, uh, you know, I grew up religious. And so when I hear weird things, I immediately think demon. 
And because it's the only box I can put it in, you know, what right, I mean? like exactly. what, else, what other box do you put this in? And there's no other way to explain weird things that go on. Uh, what do you make of and I'm sure you've got I know you've, you've gotten these same reports. And, you know, when it comes from the, the Bigfoot world, people who, you know, we both know in the Bigfoot world and they'll say things. And they're very eccentric, and I, I think most people take what they say with a grain of salt. Uh, but what do you make of, like, when a hunter tells you something very bizarre? Uh, I'll give you an example. I had a hunter one time. He absolutely refused to come on the show uh, and, and didn't want his name out there. But he ran into this creature, and he said it was so bizarre, he was hearing this voice telling him that to get out of here, you know, you need to leave. And he said he'd never experienced anything like that before. And, and and I used to think, well, maybe it's our subconscious telling us, run, get out of here, go. Um, and it could, still could be. But, you know, and I asked him that and he said, no, he goes, it wasn't my voice. And he goes, I don't know what to make of that. And he, again, didn't want to come on the show. He's probably 50 feet away from this thing. And he's not the only one to say that. Now, does that happen in every encounter? No. I would say your average encounter, people are running into an animal. Uh, or they'll describe a Neanderthal or they'll describe, you know, a monster. Or they're, you know, But there is those weird reports to where, I mean, what do you do with stuff like that? Where people are talking about these things vanishing before their eyes or watching this thing disappear. Um, and they're very sincere what do you what do you do with that sort of information from an eyewitness? Well, I still gather it. I definitely still gather the information, and I've got a, a, a small but a fair number of reports that uh, indicate such weird things. Um, and I, I I've spoken directly to quite a few people that uh, have observed things that don't fit the pattern very well. Like uh, one guy I remember uh, saw one. He said it was right behind him, two or three feet, five feet behind him, uh, and it, it disappeared. It faded away before his eyes. I said, well, I don't, maybe, maybe you're right, um, but I'm not going to dispute what he is observing. I'm going to assume, give him the benefit of the doubt that he's not lying to me um, and that he's not, you know, totally nuts um, and hallucinating or whatever. So, OK, well, I'm going to put that in a pile where I don't know what to do with it. People who have the, the mind speak thing going on. Like I've spoken to quite a few of those people, um, maybe quite a few, you know, a handful, less than a half dozen probably, but still um, not a not – a, uh, not a not a not a large percentage of the um, witnesses I speak to have anything like that at all. Really, um, totally the minority. But I don't think they're lying necessarily. Yeah, I think maybe a couple of them are lying or trying, uh, you know, trying to jump on board of a fun train to be on. But um, I don't think they're all lying. And so, what what could be the truth behind that? And uh, I, I think that's a fun a fun exercise as well. And I, I've taken that challenge on and started exploring other possibilities. Um, in fact, uh, I, I think I've gathered enough um, stuff to kind of start doodling around with a book or something on that if I ever get around to writing my other books first. <laughs> but um, yeah, there, there might be some truth in that. Now, is it Sasquatch related? I don't think so. I really don't. And I'll, I'll kind of briefly go into it. Like I, I noticed that uh, these people, these contactees or whatever of, of Sasquatches with the mind speak and all that jazz, they all kind of seem to walk away from the experience with this the, – with the, kind of the same overarching message. You know what I mean? Like a, kind of a, a pseudo hippie sort of message of like, hey, you're screwing up the, the planet. Maybe get your act together. You know, you need to treat each other with more respect, uh, et cetera. You know, like that kind of thing. And but I, I noticed somewhere along the line that those were the same general takeaways from people who claim to have been abducted by aliens many times. Yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, and those are the same general takeaways of the people who think that they've spoken to angels or God, or um, or whatever, or, or you know that kind of thing. It's also the same general, and this is the clincher here. This is the, the same general message that uh, people who experience near death experiences um, take away. And I, so I said, oh, that's interesting. So I started doing a little bit of reading about that. And, and and actually through years of kind of meandering, light reading, et cetera, I, I found that um, – there might be a common source for that deal. And in fact, I actually spoke to a person once who thought that they were abducted by aliens. And uh, and something interesting this person told me is that this, this person asked them, asked the voices, um, are you aliens? And uh, the answer was a laugh. They said, well, if that's the, if that's if that doesn't scare you so much, then yeah, we're aliens. And I said, oh, 
Isn't that interesting? And so I'm kind of that wondering if all the messages are the same, maybe the messenger is the same and it's willing to adopt to it, adopt its form or pretend to be or convince you it is um, something that doesn't scare you so bad. You know, like, and yeah, that for, is. And you're right. And, I've looked into alien encounters and you're right. There is always that, you know, you need to be good to your fellow man and save the planet. And that's what I mean. Sometimes in the big four world, you get those eccentric people that are saying that. But when you talk to an eyewitness away from the big, you know, there's never even given Bigfoot a second thought. And most of what they're telling them is get out of here or I'm going to kill you or run. Usually it's not a, um, a happy message, but you know, there's a different story if you start talking to people in the Bigfoot world is as far as their message. Do you think, um, I'll give you another example, like the smell. Now, no one really knows where that smell comes from with these creatures, and it's very random. It's not always, um, I would say, less people report the smell than you might think. And you know that, Cliff, I'm saying that to the audience. There's, it's, yeah, statistically, it's 10 to 15%. But it's bizarre, the, the people that do report it because they walk into a wall of smell and it's almost like you can take one foot and walk out of the smell. You can take one foot back and you're in the smell again. And it seems to show up as quickly as it disappears. And that's always bothered me because, you know, if some great apes running around and he's extruding these, these, uh, you know, underneath his armpits, you think he'd smell the thing for a long period of time. And mo that's not how most people describe it. It's very quick and they'll smell it and it's burning. And, you know, I look into, I'm sure like yourself, Cliff, I look into ghosts, I look into aliens. I, I'm fascinated by all of it, but I'll, I'll look into it. And one thing that you'll find, and I want your, your thoughts on this, but one thing that you'll find like in a lot of demonic encounters, that same smell, like a wet dog, sulfuric, um, almost burn your eyes and burn your 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 nose. Um, they'll report that smell in, in, in a lot of demonic encounters. And I'm not saying Bigfoot's demonic. What I'm saying is you start to look across different genres, and it makes you wonder if it's all intertwined somehow. Because no one can catch a Bigfoot. It's like we're chasing a ghost. After all these years, why can't we catch one of these things? There's people out there actively trying to shoot these things. And they can't even catch up with them. Um, so it makes me wonder if there's something else going on. I mean, have you ever thought maybe there's something else going on here? Maybe it's not uh, a primate. Maybe it's not just an ape out there running around. There's there, Maybe there's something else going on here. You know, um, I have entertained the possibility, but I'm an evidence guy. And all of the evidence is squarely in the corner of non-human primate. I'm not saying they're apes. Apes are different, and I, I think that uh, that's that is you know I, I'm I'm accused of a, being an aper, um, but apes are not. Uh, yeah, we're apes. You know, like yeah. in the broad sense of the term, Homo sapiens sapiens, which is what we are. We're apes. We're hominids, um, and oddly enough, orangutans aren't hominids. They are pungids. Um, so, but they're also apes. Apes is a really big family, man. And so, yeah, are they apes? Yeah, but what I find is that the people. Um, who toss that term around vastly underestimate apes, okay? Vastly underestimate them and think that they're special in some way, which you know, we're special in some ways. We write, we read, et cetera. We use fire, but we're not that special. Our behavior kind of points at the same thing. So, but again, if I, if there was evidence that these things were interdimensional, whatever that means, I don't even think that people would throw that term around. Don't no. understand that either, my dad. Um, we're always willing to, to blab about something we don't understand to try to explain something else we don't understand. And I, I it's one of the frustrating things about humans. Um, but the evidence is there that these things fall in line um, so, with, with all the other ape behaviors. Their appearance is that of a hominid, okay? And maybe they're pongid. I don't know. If, if these things are Gigantopithecus, then they're, then they're pongids of some sort. But right now, I don't think they are. I think they're hominins. I think that they're probably some sort of robust Australopithecine. And so I'm going to call them just hominid for now. So in a, those people out there who aren't familiar, hominid is a word that scientists use to describe our family. Um, since uh, – actually, no, African apes and humans are the only hominids, okay? Uh, hominin – with an N at the end, is specifically for 
uh, everything that has been on our branch of the tree since we split off from chimpanzees somewhere between six and eight million years ago. Okay, so Neanderthals are hominins. Australopithecines are hominins. Homo habilis is hominin. We're a hominin, I guess, too, in a way. And I think that's what these things are. But the 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 description is that of a, a, a hominid of some sort. The foot structure is that of a hominid of some sort. The, the hand structure is that of the hominid of some sort. The behaviors are all that of a hominid or an ape of some sort. Um, when it, you know, what is it? When it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck, you know? Yeah. Um, it, and that's one of the things that people, pe- people like to challenge me when they come into the shop sometimes. And I don't know why. I don't know why people care what I think. Uh, I don't care what they think. Right, and we have our own realities that we deal with. Um, but they say, "Oh, the, these things are UFO, right, and interdimensional shape shift and whatevers." And and my thing back is like, if if they're if they can do all these amazing, miraculous, interdimensional, paranormal things, why are they eating roadkill, man? You know, yeah. can't they do better? Yeah, that's a good point. And and again, you could be right. I could be right. We both could be wrong. And I told Bob, I you know I told Bubba the same thing. No one really knows. It's fun to talk about it though. And and it, you oh know, yeah, I love it. Listen to other people's theories. And I used to think that too. I'll tell you a really weird story. So I this goat man. And before you laugh, just hear me out on this goat man. So a couple of years ago, probably five years ago, I was getting um, not a whole lot. I honestly, I probably had maybe eight reports of this thing in five years and but it's very bizarre it's very bizarre and it's from i'll give you another example the guy that just sent me an email he's a uh forest ranger or he used to be a forest ranger now he's a police officer he didn't want his name out there he wanted to stay anonymous and he was telling and he wrote this encounter he had with this saying and it was in the Daniel Boone National Forest, and they were sent up there. They were part of the uh, the fire crew, and there was a fire up on the hill. So he goes up there to uh, to check it out, and it looks like a small fire. So he's you know just surveying the area, and so they decide they're going to hike up the hill because the roads they can't get in via the roads. They hike up this hill, and they come into this clearing. Now all, the rest of the guys are behind them. And the fire's going. It's not a big fire, but it's it's going. And he goes, I don't know what to tell you what this thing was, man. He goes, uh, he goes, it was so weird. And he said it was a half man, uh, half goat dancing in the fire. And he goes, I've never seen anything like that. He goes, I stood there and watched it probably for 15 seconds. And it was very physical. And he said it turned and looked at him and kind of had this look of like, oh, well, I've been caught, you know, kind of shock. And so it takes off to the wood line. And he said, as it was walking off to the wood line, it just like dissolved. And he goes, I'm not on drugs. I wasn't drinking. He's like, I've been in law enforcement for a long time. And as it was going away in the, into the tree line, it, he said it like dissolved. And one of the fire guys come up behind him and he asked one of the fire guys, did you see that? And the guy goes, that goat? And he goes, where'd it go? And he goes, I just caught a quick glimpse of it. And he was sitting there thinking that was no goat, but you get those weird reports. And then the other, and I'm going somewhere with this, but you get, re- I've gotten reports from, it's mainly loggers, forest rangers, and law enforcement that have seen this. I've had one fisherman that's seen them, but mainly it's guys in law enforcement. And you get reports from everything from them eating. Uh, I've had guys walk up towards them and they're eating and they think it's a goat bent over till it stands up. And then it, takes off and you get and it leaves tracks physical tracks and i think it's some weird demonic entity again that's me putting it in a box but i mean what else a half man half goat doesn't exist we both can agree on that right like biologically it doesn't make sense well, yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I would also agree with that, like dogmen, same thing. I don't right. see the ecological niche for them, but that doesn't mean they're not real, you know, the, uh, and well, I don't want to interrupt your story, but um, th- there are several things about that. Um, I, I love all weird stuff. And it turns out that the Sasquatch one, that's the one that sticks because you throw a lot of stuff at the walls and you try to see what sticks, right? It turns out that the evidence is clearly there for Sasquatch as being a perfectly normal animal, right? But that doesn't mean I don't love all this other weird stuff too. And there might be some sort of reality behind them as well. Now, is it an ecological uh, – is there an ecological niche for these things? Like is, are these a biological reality? I don't think so. 
Um, that, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. There's not the tradition of these sort of things. But yet at the same time, you look back and – like I'm, I'm, I was perusing this book the other day from my library, uh, The History of Wild Men in Europe. Right, and they start uh, um, with uh, um, like obviously a long ways back, but they they uh, were talking about um, satyrs and fawns, which is basically what you're describing. Yeah, you know, half man, half goat sort of thing. And there's a tradition of those sort of deals. Although they did point out that uh, the the satyr sort of thing was a much later development. It was kind of interesting to see the history of how of when and where these uh, these um, I'll just call them archetypes. Um, surfaced and when they became um, not popular but prevalent you know in the art and stories and things like that so I'd have to wonder like if the satyr that this person saw um, if that is some sort of bubbling up to the surface of the uh, of the archetype somehow like the Jungian archetype and uh, if, and those people who are interested in this sort of thing uh, I think I would recommend they read Jung uh, which is J-U-N-G uh, he's a very prominent psychologist from the earliest part of the 20th century he actually wrote a whole book on UFOs for example, and a lot of people aren't aware of that, that like this scientific psychologist guy like wrote um, a UFO book. And the premise of his UFO book is that like the, your consciousness itself can manifest physical objects um, and sometimes does so just to make you question the reality, really, I guess, for lack of a better term. That's my, my shaky understanding of what his hypothesis was. But he had wrote a whole book on UFOs, and I believe that's – if I understand it correctly, that's the conclusion he came to is that your consciousness uh, is actually much – a little bit more powerful than most people give it credit towards, which – Brings about the you know the positive vis- visualization and all that sort of stuff that people are into. Um, it can actually manifest things and sometimes does so just to mess with you, just to make you question certain things. Yeah, no, it's bizarre. If you ever get a chance, even like the uh, I think it's called the Pope Lick Monster, um, and it's oh, I've heard of that. Yeah, in Kentucky, and and you know people die on that bridge and they're chasing this thing up on the bridge. It's just bizarre to me. It's just really really bizarre. That people are running into these weird things out in the woods. Um, have you ever seen the lights, the the balls of light people talk about? Have you ever been out there and seen those for yourself? No, never, never. I've been around uh, when other people have, um, and I've seen a video or two that I find interesting, but um, I've never seen them for myself. And you know that that's kind of the thing too is like people say, no, they turn into orbs, or no, they're sprites, or no, they're those are ghost bigfoots or whatever whatever they're trying to sell me. Right. Um, but I say, well, you know, you're basing that off of your own experience. I have never once experienced that. I don't, I get the right to do that as well. Don't, don't I have the right to base my own beliefs off my own experience or do I got to take your word for it? Even though I don't know you. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. I mean, I've seen them and I, I didn't think it was Bigfoot related when I saw it. I still don't necessarily believe it's Bigfoot related. It was just a weird ball of light and there was no explanation for it. Hovering, you know, four feet above a creek in the middle of the night, in the middle of the woods. And it was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. It didn't turn into anything. It just was this weird looking light. And I still have no explanation for it. It's no, I've toyed around at the idea. Maybe that's some sort of like a uh, um, residue from infrasound or something, like some sort of thing like that. Because it, it has happened in areas where I think there were Bigfoots around. Like Bobo and I were, once were at a place up by Bluff Creek and uh, he claimed to have seen a basketball size blue light. And he's, he said that I was too short to see it. But to <laughs> me, that sounds like Bobo slamming me. I'm not sure. And then... Um, because uh, Bobo does take uh, some pride in his height, I guess. Because, you know, uh, funny, the, going off on Bobo for a second, and I love the man, don't get me wrong, but um, when the South Park thing came out and Bobo was depicted as being very, very dumb, which is unfair to him, of course, um, the, the two things he complained about, about the South Park depiction, is like, they, they treated me like I was a, a, a freaking idiot, dude, and they made me just as tall as Cliff is. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, but he claimed to have seen one of these things. And another time I found it very interesting because this is another multiple witness sort of thing. Bobo happened to be one of the witnesses again, though. Um, I was Bigfooting. I don't even must have been maybe 2008 or something like that um, up on Vancouver Island. And I was up there with a bunch of the BFRO people. M- Moneymaker was there. He pulled out a bunch of the BFRO pe- people at the time. And uh, 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 Bobo was there. And um, another woman named Cindy was there. And it was a good time, you know. Um, but uh, 
Cindy and Bobo wandered off on these abandoned railroad tracks that were maybe eight or 10 feet above the forest floor, you know, this big rise sort of thing. And they were abandoned, you know, and we were back at camp and um, they, they wandered away. And 20, 30 minutes later, um, I get a call on the radio. This Bob Cindy says, hey, man, my my my, uh, my light's dying or my therm is dying. That's what it was. My thermal imager is dying. I need more batteries. And I said, yeah, man, no problem. And uh, so I was getting some batteries together and I and. I dawdle a little bit. I've got a pretty elastic sense of time. And so I was taking longer than I, I intended. But at some point, I was just about ready to go. Then Bobo radioed in and says, okay, Cliff, I see you, but you need to go more to the right. I'm up in here. You're going too far to the left. And I'm back at camp. And like I go, hey, what? And then everybody stops, you know, Moneymaker and Wally was there as well. And um, they go – and I radio back to Bobo. What you say? He says, yeah, I see you. I see your headlamp. But um, you're go- – you're, you're, you're walking too far to the left. You need to turn to the right and come out about 100 yards from you. I go, what are you seeing? That's not me, man. He goes, what? And and then he and, he and Cindy watched this little dot, an LED sort of thing of light going through the woods like it's a headlamp or something at a distance. And then at some point they lose track of it. And that was it, you know. So I was nearby, but I didn't see the thing. You know, but obviously it happened. We have two witnesses there who are, you know, who are not going to lie and all that yeah. sort of stuff. So it's bizarre, man. There's so many weird things to run into, even out in the woods. You know, outside of Bigfoot, I've heard a lot of bizarre things that people run into that that has nothing to do with Bigfoot, uh, like that goat thing. That mm-hmm. and again, those are very rare. I haven't gotten too many of those reports, but you know, like Dogman, I tend to agree with you on Dogman. I really think Dogman is some weird entity that presents itself that way because i've i've talked to people who've shot at it and this thing doesn't react when it's being shot at it's strange though because i that's the other thing i don't understand is there is reports of them eating like chickens and leaving footprints and it's like i can't i can't explain any of that like how does it if it's a and maybe in my mind i think if something is spiritual or it's more demonic it's not going to leave footprints. It's not going to eat, you know, what's the point in eating something? But you always hear those weird reports of that. But I, I still agree with you, Cliff. I, I think it's something, some weird entity. It's not a biological animal that people are seeing. People are well, seeing the, it, though. the universe is a really amazing, wonderfully weird place. Um, it, I mean, I often like to say, I forget who said this originally, but the the, the universe isn't not, not only – is it weirder than you think? It's actually weirder than you can think. You can't comprehend how weird this place is. Um, it just turns out that Bigfoot isn't really one of those weird things. You know, Bigfoots are kind of boring at the end of the day. They're a perfectly normal animal. And I think that's really what makes them so cool. Um, but these other things, like the, the dog man thing, like that, that one perplexes me because – I would like to write it off as misidentified misidentified Sasquatches, but I can't because I know two excellent witnesses, um, and I and I know them well. They don't know what they saw either, though. But they clearly thought, you know, it looked like a wolf on two legs. Um, or you know, there's another story. I, I got a report a couple years ago from Vader, Washington. Uh, um, the, this couple was driving down these farm roads, you know, off off the, off the grid there, and uh, they drove by what they thought was a stump. Yeah, like a seven foot stump. But as they drove by, it spread its wings and flew in front of their car. And so they were looking at a seven foot tall owl. Uh, Well, God, I've never heard that one before. And of course, since then, I've heard secondhand or third hand, you know, a handful of other stories uh, of similar things. I think Ken Gerhardt actually has one or two of those things written up in his book about the flying hominoids or um, whatever that book is called. I forget. But, um, yeah, that's another weird thing. It's like that. I I kind of don't think that there are seven foot tall owls, um, in general. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's kind of where I've come down. It's like, what the hell was that about? I don't know, but I love it. It's cool. Yeah, there was one um, on the I five bridge a couple of years back. A guy took a picture of it. Do you remember that? No, and it was in no, the. You yeah, have no. to dig it up. Yeah, it was this weird looking. Uh, just how you described is basically what, if you can imagine, that's what it looked like. And it was on, it was on the top of the I-5 bridge and a guy took the picture from, um, you know, on the other side of the Columbia river, the Hoosong and Larry's Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. he snapped a picture of it and he was trying to figure out what it was. He was like, it was the biggest bird. I think it was in the newspaper or it was actually on the news and that no one knows what it was. And it was that one quick picture he took of it. Sitting on the I-5 bridge, man. It was bizarre. I'll have to dig that up. I've talked about that before, and I've looked for the article. It was years ago. 
Um, but he snapped that picture. It, it's fascinating. There's so many weird things. That's why I like to listen to people, you know, and I know you do it, and Bobo does the same thing. And after a while, you might hear something you think is crazy, and then a year down the road, it may not seem so crazy anymore. You, you know, yeah. people give you no, information. I totally agree with that. And I, I love all the weird stuff, but don't ask me to believe it. I just like to listen to it and I'll decide for myself what I believe later, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's what it's kind of come down to with the Bigfoot thing. It's like I, I'm, I'm interested now in Sasquatches because I've always been interested in weird off the beaten track sort of topics. Um, it just so happens that Sasquatch actually has the evidence behind it and every, and not everything, but most other things you have to rely on somebody else's subjective experience and their observational skills. And I just, and I don't care how experienced a woodsman you consider yourself, you're still seeing the world through a bunch of filters. And I don't, I may not have the same filters as you do. So, um, your observation is, is by far the most meaningful to you. Um, and you got to expect that, you know, my observations should be less meaningful to other people than they are to myself. You know, like when I hear when I, that thing that walked down Notice Creek at uh, Monica and I, um, well, you know, that's my experience. Do I know it was a Sasquatch? No, I think it was, but I'm not going to convince you and I don't think you should be convinced by it. We all need to be more skeptical and I, and I'm really skeptical of a lot of stuff. Um, uh, and we all should be. See if it passed the muster because if there's one thing I know is that you can look as hard as you want at the truth, it can withstand the scrutiny. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. And I, and I think, too, you know, not only be skeptical, but also be open minded enough to hear people because there's been a lot of people I disagree. I flat out disagree with. And but I'll walk away and go that guy might be right. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. and I'll, and so I'll change my opinion as as I go on or my hypothesis, I'll change after talking to people and stuff. A lot of it's changed over the years and things that I would refuse to listen to in the past. Uh, now I'll listen to them, you know, and I'll go, well, maybe they're right. You know, it's like Ron Moorhead used to, I used to argue with him, you know, he does his quantum uh, Bigfoot thing and, and Ron's brilliant, by the way. I, I love, love Ron. the man, love, love the man. Yeah. Good friend. Great man. And, but I used to argue with him and he'll tell you this. I used to sit there and argue with him about, uh, when we were talking about the subject and uh, I love Ron cause he put up with my arrogant, you know, he'd put up with me and, uh, but he used to always say, uh, you could be right, Wes, you could be right. And then I'd walk away and go, God, he got me again. Like, how do you argue back with someone saying you could be right? Yeah. You know, and so, <laughs> no, I can't. I can't be. <laughs> so well, you know, that brings up something is that, um, and the God, the Bigfoot community, and I think all uh, niche communities are probably guilty of this to various degrees. Um, uh, uh, people get pretty offended when you don't agree with them. And I think that's ridiculous. I think that we should make it a point to hang out with people who we disagree with. Uh, because if you, again, the, the truth can handle the scrutiny. If you can't handle your paradigm, your your model of the world or, your, or Bigfoot or anything being questioned – um, that's to me seems like it's pretty flimsy ground to begin with. Uh, if you don't even like being questioned on what you believe to be true, uh, I, I think it, we owe it to ourselves to hang out with people uh, and and go get a beer with somebody who totally dis like a, a good friend of mine, Tom Powell, for example. Um, I couldn't disagree more with him about Sasquatches, but I love the man, and he always shoots things at me, and I keep a very open mind. Uh, I don't. Tom did a, a special event at our museum uh, um, before we had to close down. I think it was in January or maybe February. Um, and part of his thing is that he uh, uh, does a lot of stuff um, up the Mackenzie River, for example, in, in Oregon. And he's been doing these experiments. He actually puts out tic-tac-toe boards because he thinks that the Bigfoots are like, you know, moving things around on the tic-tac-toe boards. And maybe he's right. You know, I, I don't think he is, but maybe he's right. Um, and he goes, Cliff, ah, what, what do you have to lose? Try it. So I did. You know, uh, in my yard, um, and I've got I've got a, a number of acres up um, up by Marmont uh, outside of Portland, and of course, like most people, I chose my property location based on sighting reports. Um, I'm assuming you did the same, but uh, uh, so there's occasionally we have indications that a Sasquatch might be around. It's not you know it's not one of these things. It's not banging on my door asking for garlic or something every day, but like 
two or three times a year, something weird happens on the property that'd be a lot easier to explain if Sasquatches were cruising around. Um, so I did. I, I put a tic-tac-toe board up on top, on top of my property. It's been out there for a week or two now, but nothing's happened, of course. But Tom's right. Like, Cliff, you keep an open mind. Maybe something will happen. And what do you have to lose? It's free. Like, oh, yeah, you're right. So let's try this. Let's let's try a little science here. Let's let's see if this is going on. So far, it hasn't. But um, so that it's still fun. Yeah, it's I don't, worth the try. I don't think anything's on. gonna happen, and I yeah. I bet you anything I'll win yeah. if it does happen. But <laughs> yeah, I hear you. <laughs> or it'll be a draw. I saw you know war games. It'll be a draw. I know better. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you, man. I, and I like that about. And I wasn't expecting that from uh, either you or Bobo. Um, to be, it's like I was telling Bobo, I like how you guys approach the subject. You guys aren't, you know, you get these people that will, you know, they'll, everything's a fact. They'll break down all the facts for you. You know, Bigfoot does this, Bigfoot does that. Big, and it's like, well, how do you know that? How do you know what you're saying is true? You know, just because you claim to observe it doesn't make it so. Um, but you'll hear these guys and they got an answer for everything, you know, regarding behavior and this and that. And I think it, some of that, it's hard to do that in the Bigfoot world. It's hard to get along with people. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm the jerk. Uh, but some of these guys, you know, they're cut from this narcissistic DNA cloth, a lot of them. And it's hard to have the conversations like you and I are having right now because it's like, nope, you're wrong. You're 100% wrong. And it's like, I wish people would sit and listen to each other. I told Bubba the same thing. The Bigfoot world would actually talk instead of fight and quit being number one they'd probably accomplish a lot. Yeah, you know, that's another takeaway from Tom Powell. Um, and again, I, I couldn't disagree with more of them about Sasquatches, but uh, uh, but why not give it a try? Like this tic-tac-toe thing I'm doing right now, it's kind of fun. I don't expect anything, but maybe something will happen. Surprise me. But Tom says, you know, he goes, Cliff, I love, I love what you're doing. I'm glad you're trying to film one. I'm glad you're trying to learn about these. I'm glad you're doing the footprint stuff because that means I don't have to. Yeah, and no that's doubt. and that's a great attitude. So I'm I'm glad Tom's doing what he's doing because because I don't want to, and I'm, that means I don't have to, you know. Because if he does come up some, uh, and he's come up with some very intriguing, funny things, like the whole Chehalis project thing, you know. I don't know if you read the locals. Yeah, I haven't. No. Uh, oh, you haven't. You should check it out. It's, it was actually a pioneering book in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and and I'm saying that as a you know totally physical sort of biological kind of thing. It was very pioneering in a, in, a, in a tremendous number of ways. Um, but like uh, his Chehalis project stuff, uh, unbeknownst to um, other researchers at the time, he actually enlisted a psychic to try to talk to the Sasquatches that were um, frequenting these people's properties, and he got weird results. Um, and and a lot of these results are written up in his uh, another one of his books, his second nonfiction book, which is called Edges of Science. And uh, like for example, he knew that they needed you know a, a body or uh, bones or something to prove the animal. So he had the psychic communicate to them or try to communicate to them, hey, can you give us a bone or something like that? You know, and then uh, he didn't tell the property owners he was doing this either. And like within a couple of days, uh, I don't remember the exact number of days, you can read his book and find out, um, they found a bone at the base of a tree where they had hidden a camera. Um, and they actually got a Sasquatch photograph, by the way. Uh, a lot of people don't know that either. It's not very good, but uh, they actually, I believe, they got a Sasquatch photograph from that camera. And this was after that. Um, they got a bone placed at the bottom of the tree, and it was a weird bone. And so, and like uh, the property owners called Tom and said, "Yeah, we got this bone laid out by this tree." And Tom didn't tell him about this psychic experiment he was doing. Um, and then it turns out they they figured out that uh, the bone was from uh, a breastbone from an emu. And the closest emu farm was about five miles away and coincidentally owned by the, the, the father of the property owner. Interesting. That is yeah, interesting. Like, what, what, what the hell is that about? Yeah. You know, but I think that stuff's hilarious. Totally fun. Totally funny. And, uh, and legitimate science in a way because he was doing a, 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 a double blind or single blind – I forget which one – experiment where nobody knew he was doing this except for Tom and the, the, the so-called psychic. And they got a weird result after. I think that's hilarious. I mean, I'm glad Tom does stuff like that because not only is it fun and a great story, but it's true. And you know, I'm busy trying to track individuals through the footprint data set. You know, I've got other things to worry about. Yeah, I hear you. And like you said, I mean, that is kind of fun. And you know, science really is curiosity. 
John used to tell me that all the time. He's like, you know, don't science is curiosity at the end of the day. It's wanting to figure something out. And I think that's what we're all trying to do. I mean, we're not scientists, don't get me wrong, but I, in the spirit of John, um, I, I think he's right. I think, you know, science really is curiosity and you got to try different things. Kind of like what Tom's trying. Why not try it? You got nothing to lose, you know? Right. Right. And, and John is a, is a, I miss him. Ben and Ogle, of course, it's like a, what a beacon of hope for all of us. He was willing to listen to anybody. He, he would listen to the most outrageous claims and try to make sense of them. Um, and he was such a humble, simple, kind man. I, I, I sincerely miss John. I was, it's an honor to, to have called him a friend. The greatest, one of the greatest compliments anybody in the Bigfoot field has ever given me was from John. And he simply told uh, Dan Perez once um, something to the effect of, I'm a big fan of Cliff. It's like, oh, yeah. it, make me, it almost makes me cry, man. Yeah. I just love John so much. And I think people out there who knew John you know, would take that as a huge compliment. And John's probably one of the greatest human beings I've ever met. I mean, just on it, just being a good human being. Outside of Bigfoot and outside of being a science guy and outside of it, John was just a great human being. And I've learned so much from him and may he rest in peace. And um, But, you know, with your kind of change, kind of a weird way to change topics, but um, I don't want to keep you too much longer, Cliff. I know you have your podcast, Bigfoot and Beyond, and it comes out every Saturday around 10 o'clock. Uh, you'll get a new podcast. What do you have coming up with the podcast? I know you guys were kind of record ahead of time, but what do you have coming up for people who are listening? We interviewed Russ Jones, who's a, uh, an author and a Bigfoot investigator. I, th I think that's going to be a two-parter, but though I could be wrong about that. But I know in the next couple of weeks, we have Paul Graves coming up. We have uh, Adam Davies. We speak to him. Uh, and I love Adam. Uh, um, Adam's a good, good friend of mine. We, we had a kind of a, a crucible relationship at the beginning because I had heard about him and read about him for years, like I'm sure most people have, you know, because he's so prolific in what he does. And then my first chance to meet him, I was going to go camping in a tiger preserve with Adam Davies in Sumatra for a week. It's like, oh. Well, God, that's a good way to get to know somebody, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we and I both share that bond and great stories. So we kind of reminisce about that, looking for the Orang Pendek in Sumatra together, um, as well as his other research. Um, God, we, oh, we talked to Mark Marcel, who, of course, uh, um, rediscovered the Ape Canyon cabin site. Those are the things coming up in the next few weeks. And we have a couple other possible guests lined up. We're trying to get ahead of the curve, you know, since everybody's on lockdown with the plague and all. It's, as you know, but probably better than anybody, it's, it's stressful to try to pump one of these shows out every single week. So uh, we're trying to get ahead of the curve a little bit. Um, try, I guess we're trying to flatten our own curve in a way, aren't we? Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to the next episode. Uh, it's Bigfoot and Beyond, and whatever podcast you're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles on, uh, definitely check the guys out. Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. Uh, Cliff, thank you again for coming on. Oh, anytime, anything. You just let me know what I can do to help you, and I'll, I'm here. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Until next time, everyone. 